It's the ability we all have just to click on an image instantly. You click it, it's there. It's open. You can share it. You can save it. You can repost it. It's the possibility of seeing a gory image. A shocking, scandalous image. And it's right there. It is right there on your phone or your computer. But the question is, do you click? Would you click? If you received a message that said you were able to view a horrific, real life situation in its full, bloody gory, would you click? This is your life and it's ending one minute at a time. Welcome to Extraordinary Stories Podcast. Hey, how are you? Are you well? Are you good? I am. So it's time for a new episode. And this is a story I've been fascinated with for so long. Now, it gets gruesome. It gets creepy. And it is a reminder that sometimes human beings are just... Rubbish. Are you ready? Okay, let's go. Okay, the web. The World Wide Web. <laughs> Cyberspace. <laughs> the I don't know what are what are the other names for the internet there's lots of them the the information superhighway well that's just really wanky isn't it like no one's going to use that i don't think you're about to say well i'm i'm just about to um jump onto the information superhighway and find out where the nearest mcdonald's is and uh, i don't think so but yeah the internet okay it's given us more more than we could ever have imagined that it might give us. It's given us access to people all across the world. It's given us answers to big questions. Just yesterday, I googled how many women have won the Nobel Prize versus the amount of men who've won the Nobel Prize. And I'm going to tell you, that's some pretty shocking statistics. This story is not about the Nobel Prize. I'm just sharing this with you. Do you know that 899 men have won the Nobel Prize and 53 women have won it. I found that shocking. I found that absolute shocker ammo. Anyway, that aside, that's just one of the things that the internet is there for. You know, lots of other things. You can find shops you never knew existed. You can, you know, there's porn. There's, I mean, there's everything. Everything is out there. But one of the other things that the internet has brought to us is this whole world of insta-famous people. The ordinary people, you know, just like you and me, who get themselves an account, get themselves a following, and then a level of fame 
which other people start to envy. And I mean, really, when you zoom out on the whole thing, the whole situation is bonkers, isn't it? All these insta-famous people who are just like your ordinary people going about their life and then all of a sudden they've got 17 billion followers and then it's the, all these like, you know, who's more popular than who? And Oh, she's only got 6 billion of oh, boring. Who cares? I mean, I'm saying who cares, but I think I could be totally insta-famous. <laughs> I think I could. I think I could totally do it. I mean, I think all you need to really do is just, like, set up your camera and, like, make some smoothies, I think, and, like, wash your face and all that on camera and be like, ooh, I'm using this skincare. I think it's dead easy. Anyway, so this is how, as we know, so, so many people now just construct their life around being famous online. And... There's a lot of people who are very successful at it. Yes, okay, there's a lot of people who make a lot of money through advertising. And there's a lot of people who do go on to go on to all these bloody reality TV shows because they have been insta-famous or whatever. But there's a lot of people out there, especially young people, who just want to maybe get a little bit of that. They just kind of want a little bit of that famousness. And this was the case for Bianca Devins. Okay, who is Bianca? Well, she is a 17 year old girl who lives with her parents in Utica. Now I hope I said that correctly. Utica, Utica, I'm gonna go with Utica. And that's in New York. So, Bianca lived with her parents and she had an older brother and a younger sister. And where they live, it's like a really suburban neighbourhood bit of New York. So, what about Bianca? Well, she is 17 years old. She is described as slim, pretty and artistic. So when you see the sort of images that she first starts putting up online, what you'll see is this very lovely, very attractive 17-year-old girl and she's got sort of really nice, like, brown hair and she does all these photographs which are a bit like, um, what's the best way to describe them? Well, I guess they're sort of staged for her to look a little bit Moody. Moody is the word I'm going to use. Now, whether or not Bianca was going for Moody, I, I, I don't really know. There's a, there's a sort of, yeah, there's a drama about her photographs. What she'll do is she'll often put up like a photograph of her looking into a mirror and she'll put words like, is this it? Well, she's looking into the mirror. You know that kind of thing, like, there's just, you know, that little bit of... Or, like, when she's wearing eyeliner. It, there's photographs of her, like, you know, with her new, putting on her new eyeliner. And she'll be like, today is the day. And it's all just a bit... You know the kind of thing I'm talking about, these kind of things. I'm not saying she was going for moody. I, I very much think she might have been going for sultry. But I don't know. Sultry, moody, they can often get confused. I certainly know quite often when I'm doing my sultry face, and I think I'm being very sultry, I get a lot of, are you in a bad mood? <laughs> Which is maybe I need to think about my face a bit more. So, Bianca. She goes under the name Ecstasy on Instagram. And like I said, she would post all these pictures of her in her bedroom looking into a mirror. She would write things like, do you love me? And in another one, she's wearing like an Iron Maiden t-shirt and it says like, is this all there is? So, Bianca, I mean she has, she has a bit of a following. Now we're not talking Beyonce levels in the millions, but you know, she was beginning to become known as an e-girl. She was really becoming, kind of, you know, had a little bit of a following. She had thoughts one day about becoming a model. 
That was maybe what she wanted in her future. Know how she feels? <laughs> A joke. Now, does Bianca see this as her life forever? No. No, she doesn't. She is a very, very smart girl and actually what she wants to do is she wants to become a psychologist and she plans to go to college and then to university and in the next couple of years of her life she wants to become a psychologist who specifically is there to help vulnerable teenagers. And this is why. Growing up in her early teens, Bianca had went through some bouts of depression, she'd been through bits of anxiety and, you know, she hadn't had the most pleasant of early teenage years and it was quite rough for her and and her family and so she decided that coming through it, the best thing that she could do was try to help other people. Now there was a period in early 2019 when Bianca had a mental health episode and what happened was she went out into her car that was sitting on her parents' driveway. She locked herself inside the car and just refused to leave. And she became really upset to the point of hysterical when anyone tried to get her out of the car to the point where her parents had to call a doctor and she was taken away to a mental health facility for three months. And then she returned home. So tough, yeah, tough, really, really tough. But like I said, you know, she, the will is there to get better. And um, what she wants to do is she wants to go and study. But for now, she's doing this, right? She's doing this Insta-famous thing. And so she's got about 3,000 followers. And the kind of things that she would do, she would cut her hair, she would dye it, you know that kind of like, um, she would dye her hair that really like, do you know that sort of soft pink colour that's really popular at the moment, think sort of um, the good witch from the Wizard of Oz vibes, that kind of like bubblegummy pink. And she was putting up her posts and they were going to things like Instagram, and Facebook, and something called 4chan. Now, a lot of you might be aware of what 4chan is. I wasn't. I was not aware of what this was. So I had to do some research. And what I discovered about it is that 4chan is a huge social media site. And I mean, yeah, like I say, I had no idea what this was. Basically, it's an anonymous forum where users can pretty much post anything they want. And I kind of mean anything. There's very few rules with 4chan. And in the past, it's been responsible for some pretty dark stuff that's happened online. So I don't know if you remember a few years ago, this one was fucking horrendous. There was the hashtag going around, cut for Bieber which was encouraging fans to self-harm for Justin Bieber. That started on 4chan. The hacktivists and infamous group Anonymous, you know, the ones with the masks and the hacking and all that, well, they started on 4chan. Another thing it's famous for is leaking naked photographs of celebrities. And I mean, I don't want to completely drag it through the dark. People say it can actually be a very positive place online. There's no pressure. Things like posts go up, but they get deleted very quickly. And you know, the whole thing's anonymous and it gives people a chance to go in and chat about something they're really interested in without having to reveal who they are. And anyway, 4chan will become very important to Bianca's story. So here she is, she's 17, she's got this online following and her parents are, well they're keeping an eye on her just to make sure that she is safe. For her parents, in a way, this was kind of a positive thing for Bianca 
it's sad to say, but at 17 years old, she didn't really have that many physical friends. It was really all about the online for Bianca. And I guess, I guess through her Instagram and through all these places, she'd sort of found a bit of a community. She'd found people to chat with and she could spend hours with. And you know, we could spend a long time here weighing up the pros and the cons of your friendships being virtual versus them not being virtual. Let's not do that. That would be dull. Let's just accept this is what it was for Bianca, okay? Now, it's through Instagram that she attracts the attention of a man called Brandon Andrew Clark. Okay, so Clark. I'm going to surname him. (laughs) I'm just going to call him Clark. Clark was 21 years old. And he had seen Bianca's Instagram page and he followed her. He liked the look of Bianca. And the two of them, they started talking. Before too long, he had slid into the DMs on Instagram, (laughs) as the kids say. And so they're direct messaging each other back and forth. And they're chatting and they're getting along just fine. Now, Clark, he lives just about an hour away from where Bianca's parents' home was. And he suggests that they get together at some point. Now, not a date, not a date, just friends. Bianca thinks about it and she agrees. She thinks, okay. Yeah, I will meet Clark. And when they do meet, they get on very, very well as friends. Now, in the story of Bianca, there are many, many inconsistencies. And this is the major one. So I'm just going to point this out now. People will say that Clark was her boyfriend. He was not. Let me make it very crystal clear, your (laughs) honour. He was not her boyfriend. They were friends. Now, did Clark want to be her boyfriend? Possibly. Well, more than possibly. Did Bianca want this? No. No, she didn't. She just wanted friendship. Part of what sort of drew them together, really, and a lot of what fueled the conversations is that Clark hadn't had the easiest of upbringings. He came from quite a violent family home. He too had struggled with depression, with anxiety. And so for Bianca, you know, here's this guy. He's three, four years older than her, and he's becoming a really good friend. Now... Bianca's dad steps in here. Good on him. I like that he did this. He steps in and he says, look, if you are going to be meeting a man that you met on Instagram, I need to make sure he's not a psycho. (laughs) You know, fair enough. So I want you to bring him to the house. And that is exactly what she does. Bianca brings Clark to meet her family and they really like him. He's a good guy. They look at him and they realise, oh, actually, he's not trying to corrupt my 17-year-old daughter. They're just friends. In return, Bianca, she meets with Clark's mum and dad and gets on really well. So I can see right now, you know, I said that about inconsistencies. I can see why there's confusion, okay? People, you might think, well, they're both meeting the parents of each other. So wouldn't that kind of say that they were a couple? No, they just weren't. It's just that actually these parents were being quite savvy and going, "Mm, I'm just going to check out this online friendship you've developed with someone. So that's fine. So actually, Bianca had been talking on another online platform called Discord with another guy who was 18 years old. Now, he was also from the New York area. And the two of them, 
they'd gotten flirty with each other. Now, they hadn't met yet. They wanted to. They really wanted to. And so Bianca comes up with the perfect way for this to happen. A concert. She will attend a concert where her online romantic interest can also attend and they can spend time together. And now, all she has to do is two things. She has to get her parents to agree that she can go to the concert. That's number one. It's a four hour drive from their home right into the centre of New York and... She's not sure how her mum and dad are going to feel about that, okay? But she's going to get to asking them. And secondly, she has to work out how is she going to get there? So, so she addresses the how am I going to get there problem. First of all, she asks Clark, her friend, her buddy. She says, look, would you drive me to the concert? And he agrees. He says, okay, yeah, fine. I'm happy with that. And now to her parents. Well, they're a little less easy to convince. They think about it. Do they really want their 17-year-old daughter driving four hours away to go to a concert? Not sure. But they say, well, okay, as long as you're with Clark, that's fine. Because you see, they trust Clark in Implicitly. So, that's great. Now, Bianca is thrilled. She's absolutely thrilled because what this means is she can go to the concert, she can meet with the online boyfriend who, so far, they've just been texting and sending messages and pictures back and forth and now, finally, she can meet him. And, on top of that, she can also go and get to see one of her favourite acts in concert. Now, I don't know who this artist is. Maybe she's really big in America, I don't know. Nicole Doppelhanger? (laughs) Doppelganger? Nicole, I think, yeah. I think she, was she a pussycat doll? I think she might have been a pussycat doll. Anyway, that's, that's, that's completely it. Aside from the story, it doesn't really matter. But that's who, um, the concert is, that's, that's who they're going to see. All right, so the days are leading up to the concert and Bianca is getting very excited. She's spending time choosing what she's going to wear. Her and Clark are planning the details. When will they pick her up? What time will they leave? And finally, the time for the concert arrives. So, Clark picks up Bianca. They set off on the four-hour drive And on the way, they're playing some music. Bianca is uh, texting and Instagramming all the way. She's documenting her night out. Clark is really loving driving Bianca to somewhere she really wants to be. And it's when they arrive at the venue that Bianca tells Clark she is meeting someone. Who asks Clark? Well, it's someone she's been chatting to and who she quite likes. Clark goes quiet. He doesn't like this news at all. You see, Clark was very good at pretending that he was okay with the friends thing. But was he? No. No, he wanted Bianca as his girlfriend and now this was a fucking mess. He's driven her to a concert and she's here. She has the cheek to be here meeting someone else. Furious does not describe how Clark feels. So, Bianca, when they get to the concert, sends some messages to the guy she's been chatting to, and he appears. He introduces himself to Clark. 
He tells Bianca it's great to meet her in person. And the three of them climb into Clark's car. They share a joint just before they go in to the gig. While inside watching Nicole schlop and hang her, <laughs> Bianca and her online boyfriend, they do something they do something which is going to change Bianca's life forever. And she doesn't even know it. They kiss. They hold hands and they kiss. And all the while, Clark is watching this. His blood begins to boil and a rage sets in. To Clark, this is the ultimate slap in the face. He has spent months being Bianca's friend, hoping, hoping this would turn into something else. Meeting her family, being her best friend, and now this. She's standing at a concert, holding another guy's hand and kissing him. So the concert ends. The gig is over and it's time for the four hour drive back to Utica to drop Bianca home. Bianca says goodbye to her online boyfriend and she promises she will message him straight away. She gets into the car with Clark and they begin the drive. During the drive there, both on their phones, they're chatting about how good the gig was. And, do you know, I think there's, a, it's lovely, but there's a real snapshot here of Bianca and a real reminder that she's 17 years old at this point. So she's texting back and forth with uh, one of the friends that she's got on Instagram who's saying, oh, how was the gig? Did you meet him? Etc. And it, it, she starts saying things like, Oh God, we went to the concert and we held hands. Oh my God, we kissed and he smells so nice. There's just something this kind of like, I don't know what it is, but it's like there's like there's just this innocence about the sweetness of those messages. And, you know, it's essentially the text messages of a 17-year-old who has a crush and thinks this is the love of her life. And it's just, yeah, there's something nice about it. So, they're, you know, they're on this drive back. Little does Bianca know that the guy driving her home has some very, very, very dark thoughts going on in his head at that moment. Clark is not a happy man. Bianca gets tired and she moves to the back seat of the car to sleep for a little while on the drive home. Clark says, yeah, that's fine, yeah, yeah, go, go into the back and uh, just, just you go to sleep. It's now that while he's driving, Clark starts Googling. And when he's Googling, what exactly is he searching for? What are his search terms? Well, they include, what is the quickest way to slit someone's throat. Where is the major vein in the neck? Is hanging a fast way to die? As he's doing this, he's also going onto Instagram. He's adding to his stories pictures of the dark road ahead that he can see while he's driving and he's writing things like here comes hell redemption right while bianca sleeps in the back of the car they eventually arrive in utica where she lives and clark he parks the car down a dark alley and he goes out to the trunk of the car. 
In the trunk, Clark has the following items. A knife. A razor. Duct tape. Rope. And a variety of sheets, blankets and tarps. Clark gets back into the car and he puts his phone onto the dashboard and he starts filming a video. He climbs into the back seat where Bianca is asleep. Making sure that the camera can see him and Bianca. He takes the knife that he's got from the back of his car and he cuts into her throat. Attempting to hit the main artery in her neck. And he succeeds. Blood is pouring everywhere. Bianca wakes up and she tries to fight off Clark but he slashes again into her throat and then into her chest. Now he gets his phone and he changes it to camera. He starts to photograph Bianca as she lies dying on the back seat of the car. He gets close-ups of her bleeding neck and the gaping, gaping hole that he's left. And as Bianca slowly, slowly begins to die, he continues to photograph. It's then that he goes to his Instagram he goes to the bio and he changes the details on his profile. He inputs his death date. As today, right, there and then, the same day, the same moment that this is happening. Now, it's what Clark does next that tends to grab all the headlines in this story. And for very, very good reason. He goes to Instagram and he puts up some text on an Instagram story which says, This is your life and it's ending one minute at a time. He then posts one of the images of Bianca dying in the back of his car. And he writes, I am so Sorry, Bianca. He goes to 4chan. Remember the place I mentioned earlier on? And he starts to post, I have images of a dead girl's body. Follow me for more pictures. Ugh. Just, ugh. I don't know what to say about that. Now, we know the speed of the internet, we know how it works, and this is no bloody exception. Pretty soon, minutes after he posts this, it's circulating on Instagram, it's on 4chan, it's on Twitter, that some guy has just killed his girlfriend and he's putting up pictures. And this is really now where we see how fucking sick some people can be. Some people take screenshots of Bianca's dead body and her neck wound and they start posting on their own pages and on their own fucking profiles. I've got these images. If you want to see them, follow me and I will show you them. People actually using these fucking images to try and get more followers. I mean, honestly. On 4chan, a discussion board about the photographs pops up 
very quickly. And people start posting things like, well, this is fake. I mean, it's not real. She's, she is an e-girl wannabe looking for attention. This is completely staged. Sadly, it's not. Some people see the images and they will call police. Some people report that there are images of a dead girl on Instagram and they're not sure where it's happened and they're not sure about it but they need to report it. Now these images, they spread like wildfire and it takes Instagram time. It takes time for them to try and get a handle on these images but in a way it's kind of too late. They're already out there and the problem with that is well, you've put them on Twitter, you've put them on Instagram, you've put them on this place 4chan. By the point that they're out there so many other people have saved those images, they've screenshotted them. It's just rolling out everywhere now. I mean it's it's horrific just the amount of people who are able to see the images of a girl who has been brutally murdered in the back of a fucking car it's just it's just it's horrific then what happens is people who are aware of who bianca is they start to publicly give out her address her mum and dad's address, and they start saying things like, I bet if you check the house right now, she'd be there. This is so fake. But police decide they do need to respond, but where the hell to start? They've sort of got an idea where she lives, so maybe they could start looking in that area, but is that where she was? Where the fuck are the pictures coming from? Who knows? Now, in the meantime, while police are trying to figure that out, Clark's still online. He's still chatting with people. And he's giving more and more photographs all the time. He's taking now photographs of himself. He's taking selfies next to Bianca's dead body. And then he decides he himself is going to call police. And it's not really to give himself up. Well... I say it's not really that, I think it kind of is that, but I think he sort of gets a bit, I think he gets it wrong, basically, or I think he freaks out or gets scared. I don't know what the fuck happens to him, but he calls police and he starts telling them really cryptically that there's been a murder. There's been a homicide. And he knows where the murder's happened, but he won't identify himself or the location. He's just being really weirdly cryptic. But he's sort of trying to indicate he might have had something to do with it, but not really willing to commit. And three or four times he's mid-conversation with the police, and then he just ends the call. And then he calls back. And each time he calls back, it just gets more and more confusing. Police can't really work out what they're actually dealing with on the end of the phone. Now, of course... In this age, there are wonderful advances in technology and that make it possible for people to locate where certain pictures were taken. And there is a user on Snapchat who has clicked on the images, has seen these miles away, I mean miles away from where this happened, but thinks that from the location services has actually been able to work out whereabouts Clark is posting these from. He calls police and he says, this is where I think they are. I think you need to go there. So police do. And when they arrive, this is what they see. Clark is outside of the car and there's a tarp lying on the ground. And as the police approach, they stop. They stop because Clark is currently stabbing himself in the neck with a knife and he's threatening he will kill himself. All the while he is taking photographs of himself. He's actually got the knife in one hand. He's ramming it into his neck and he's taking 
selfies at the same time. He drops the knife, he picks up a razor, he starts slashing at his own arms and then is photographing his arms. He then lies down on top of the tarpaulin. It causes it to move and police see that there is human hair underneath it. They ask him, Clark, who is under the tarp? And he tells them, it's Bianca. Clark at this point takes a selfie of himself lying on top of Bianca's dead body and he posts it straight to Instagram. So people who have been watching this unfold at home, I mean, it's absolutely insane. They're basically watching this play out bit by bit. They're seeing it from, you know, the the very first pictures that he ever put up of like a dark alley. Those ominous first messages, this is the end of your life and it's disappearing one moment at a time. All those things that he put, they're now seeing it from that through to the murder, through to her dead body, through to him now lying on top of her dead body, taking a selfie. Eventually, police persuade Clark to put the razor down and they approach him. They put him into handcuffs and they take him into the back of the police car and straight to the hospital. Now, Clark will spend weeks in hospital, recovering from his self-inflicted knife and razor wounds. And for police, it just leaves the horrific sight of Bianca dead. By now, Clark has slashed her neck so many times, she's almost decapitated. They close the scene down as a crime scene, and then they have the horrendous job of going to inform her parents. Can you imagine? Can you imagine being her parents? I mean, it's absolutely horrendous, but what happens is when police arrive at the door, they knock on the door, it's the middle of the night, and they say, can we speak to Bianca's parents? It's her brother that answers the door. They say, can we speak to her parents? It's to do with Bianca. And her parents think, okay, well, she's gone out, she's got drunk at the concert, she's got mixed up in something stupid... And then the police have to say, I'm sorry, but this is to do with Clark and a dead female. And they cannot believe that this can be Bianca. They say, that can't be true. Clark was looking after her. Clark was her friend. What the fuck are you talking about? This cannot be the case. And police say, I'm sorry, but this is the case. Bianca's body is in such a state that police don't want either her mum or dad to have to come and see her almost decapitated form. So instead, and it's just horrible, Bianca's older brother is asked to identify her body, not in person, but through the photograph of her dead on the back seat of the car. In the days that follow, as you can imagine, there is an absolute internet meltdown about this. Police, uh, social media sites, family members, they are racing to get these images down, just to get rid of all of these pictures. But as I said earlier, easier said than done. There then begins a backlash against Bianca online, which I have to say, I'm going to be really honest with you, this really shocked me. I did not think that there was going to be a backlash, but there is, because human beings can be awful people. 
people will start saying horrific things like, well, she was a slut for leading him on. She deserved it. You can't be an e-girl who wants attention and then rejects men. It just doesn't work like that. Fuck off. Fuck right off with that chat now. Some absolute sick in the head knobs send the pictures of Bianca's dead body to her aunts, to her uncles, to her cousins, to the extended family. I mean, as if, as if those people need to see that. Of course they don't. Now, obviously, you know, not all human beings are rubbish. There is a... a that's only a small, very small, part of the problem. There's a lot of people online going, I just can't believe what's happened. Like, how can this be a thing? R.I.P. Bianca becomes a trending hashtag around the world. I remember seeing that. I do remember seeing it. But I don't know I, that I totally knew that I was sure what it was about. Well, I know now. I mean, we're a bit late bit late to the party, but, you know, at least now, I know. And the singer that they had uh, gone to see in concert that night, Nicole, do you know what, I'm not even going to attempt her surname again, that pussycat doll one, she, she takes to Twitter and she uses her kind of position as a, a celebrity and she says, please, stop, if you sharing these images, if you have them, please stop sharing them. So, pretty quickly, once he's charged, Clark goes to court. And the charge is second degree murder. Okay, so why? Well, why is it second degree murder? Remember the difference, we've talked about this before, I'll not be boring and go on about it again, but the difference is, first degree murder says that it was premeditated, you meant to do this. Second degree murder says you didn't actually plan it. You did it. Yes, you did the murder. No one's saying you didn't, but you didn't plan it. Now, this is tricky because, if we remember, Clark had those weapons in his car the whole time. Now, that to me, it says premeditated. And to a lot of people, they will say, hmm. That clearly looks like when they set out to that concert that night, he knew how this was going to end. Well, his lawyers will argue, those weapons, they were not to kill Bianca. They were to kill himself. He was suicidal. That's why there was a rope. He was going to hang himself. That's why there was a knife. He was planning to knife himself in the neck. It's just that that evening, with the arrival of Bianca's other online person that she was interested in, he lost the rage and he took it all out on Bianca. So it is second degree murder. So he's in prison and he's waiting. He's waiting to find out what his sentence is going to be. And now, Clark does something in prison, which is not a bright move <laughs> by any means. He gets caught making a weapon. Yeah, it's, this is a really strange bit of the story. He uses a toothbrush to basically create like a knife, essentially, out of it. And he uses it to attack other inmates. And when he's caught, he's warned, this is a very, very, very serious thing that he has done here in prison. And that actually... This will have to go to court. And this is going to really hurt his case. What the authorities are saying to Clark now is, between the fact that it's second degree murder and the fact that you have made a weapon in prison and used it against people, you're going down for a long time. There is going to be no chance of parole for you in the future. 
you're going to be here for a very, very long time. Unless, unless you confess that actually this was first degree murder. You meant to kill Bianca that night. That was what you planned, wasn't it? And Clark at first says, no, no, it's not. It was second degree murder. I, I had those things there because I wanted to kill myself. I just, I snapped. That's when I killed Bianca. And they say, Clark, look, between the second degree murder and now you've made a weapon in prison, add those two things together. You're looking at a way longer and more harsh sentence with no chance of parole. Just say, you meant to do it. And he does. Brandon Andrew Clark realises the prison system, one way or another, they're going to get him for Bianca's murder. And he might as well just fucking confess. That way he stands a better chance of leniency somewhere down the road. And he does. He says, yep, I meant it. I planned it. I knew exactly what I was doing. Now, Bianca's family, they are so happy that he's finally confessed. What it means for the family as well, and I think this is really, really important in the story, what it means for the family is that they don't have to sit through an entire trial in court in which they would have to watch the video that he filmed of stabbing her to death. They wouldn't have to look at those pictures. They wouldn't have to see all the police crime shots of her under the tarpaulin, practically decapitated. They just wouldn't have to see them. So, by him confessing to it, that's it. He gets sentenced to 25 years to life in prison. Now the family, they have the most horrific time trying to keep the story straight. And this is a big part of the problem when anything is online. If something gets published, people often tend to believe it. So it's, I mean, go back to what I was saying earlier. It's all this chat about Clark being her boyfriend. The family are like, no, he wasn't. He was not her boyfriend. Stop saying that because it's not true. Also, you know, dickheads out there will dig into Bianca's early posts and they'll say, actually, she was quite manipulative. She was very calculating as a person. You know, she played with people online. The family will say, this is not true. You're looking at you know, a, a 16, 17-year-old's Instagram messages and you're judging her. Fuck off. Stop it. Bianca's funeral was attended by 300 people who held pictures of the teenager up and lots of them wore pink, her favourite colour. I think this is really nice. There was a benefit thrown in her town where money was raised by Bianca's family and that money was used to send another teenage girl from Utica to college. The Bianca Fund is the name of it. And so, Clark rots in jail for her murder. But what has the Bianca Devins story taught people? Like, what have we learned? Well, it's confirmed that the internet can be an ugly place. It's caused Instagram to change some settings and be stricter on what gets published. This is interesting. I thought, thought this was really interesting when I found it. Bianca's family have a direct link with uh, Instagram who can alert them at any moment when anyone tries to post the images of Bianca. Because here is the thing, the images still exist. You can see the images of Bianca dead 
in the back seat of that car if you want to. You can actually see the gaping hole in her neck if you want to. But the question is, would you click? And so ends the story. Okay, well, I think what I've learned from this story is I don't really want to be an e-girl Instagram famous person anymore. (laughs) I'm over it. (laughs) I was really into to this idea, but I I think I'm over it now. I've I've changed my mind. (laughs) I'm not going to do it. It's horrific. It's a tragic, tragic tale. It really, it really is. It's just, yeah, that poor girl. Horrible. So, I hope that you enjoyed this. And until the next episode. Okay. Goodbye. It didn't, it didn't affect me really one way or the other. <laughs> I would imagine from the look on his face Let's get it on, let's do it, let's get it over Let's get it on. Let's do it. Let's get it over.